This is Jim Schwab. I'm manager of the American Planning Association's Hazards Planning Research Center. And we're down in uh, Charleston at the uh, been at the NOAA Coastal Services Center meeting. And uh, I'm here with uh, Chad Berginis, who is the executive director of the Association of State Floodplain Managers, which is based up in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, both ASFBM and APA are Digital Coast partners. And we're talking today about the National Flood Insurance Program uh, as it relates to the issues with uh, recovery from Superstorm Sandy up in the Northeast. And Chad, um, let's start with some of the basics for some of the, uh, the people who are most affected uh, by the storm in the Northeast. Uh, if a uh, structure is damaged, someone's home is uh, damaged, what are some of the flood insurance ramifications for those folks? Jim, first of all, thank you for um, uh, for taking the time and, and talking to us a little bit about mm -hmm. flood insurance issues. Um, if, if a structure is damaged from Superstorm Sandy, um, it's first of all most important that, that folks file a claim with their insurance agent. Now, flood insurance is a little bit different than mo most normal mm -hmm. lines of insurance. Um, your rates don't automatically go up if you file a claim. However, um, with flood insurance, there are triggers that can uh, increase your claim. So if the structure is substantially damaged, uh, more than 50% of the value, then the premiums can go up next time. Uh, but there are some things homeowners can do to reduce that increase, um, and those things are called hazard mitigation. One of the things that does uh, certainly affect the, the cost of flood insurance is uh, something known as the increased cost of compliance, uh, dealing with situations where people with older homes, older structures that uh, are not in compliance with current codes uh, have to face rebuilding and then have to comp you know, comply with uh, newer codes. And certainly a, a, a good deal of the property in New York and New Jersey probably falls into that category. A lot of older property built in the Rockaways and the like. Um, what is this increased cost of compliance? Can you tell us how that works and how that might affect the outcome in, in the Northeast? Sure, Jim. Increased cost of compliance is a great aspect of a flood insurance policy that most people don't know about. Um, and I would urge anybody who has a flood insurance claim, especially if it is in that highest hazard area, that 100-year flood zone, to talk to their agent about increased cost of compliance. What this is, is this is an additional rider on the policy. Um, and, and what it does, it provides an extra amount of money, up to $30,000, uh, to help that property owner achieve compliance uh, for their structure. And usually what that means is, again, I go back to the term substantially damaged. Uh, if a structure is damaged more than 50% of its value, it has to come in compliance with the current codes. So maybe the house has to be elevated several feet mm -hmm. um, or other techniques to bring it into compliance. ICC can be used towards the cost of making that structure compliant. And then what happens once the structure is compliant is that the insurance premiums are less than if it were rebuilt to the old conditions, uh, and that's then uh, that's then a, a lower cost of living in that structure in the future. Yeah, and, and that's in large part because those folks uh, now have a, a building that's in better shape than relative to flood damages than what was the case earlier. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about people who don't have flood insurance? We always hear about a certain percentage of people who just don't have any flood insurance. Uh, the, what, what recourse do they have and how are they handled relative to the people who do? Well, you know, in, in, for, for floodplain managers, we hear a lot that flood insurance is very expensive. And certainly, um, flood insurance can be costly. Uh, if, if a house is in the highest of the high hazard areas, if it's built in a way that makes it at risk, uh, to, uh, it, for common flood events, then, then insurance uh, can be expensive. But being in a disaster and being hit by a flood without insurance is going to be a whole lot more expensive because the proposition you face there is instead of being able to file a claim where you may, let's say, have a fifty or $100,000 loss, instead what you have available 
Uh, first of all uh, are the disaster assist assistance mm -hmm. options. And even though disaster assistance in this country is quite generous, uh, the maximum amount is up in over $30,000, uh, the statistics tell that the average individual assistance claim is only between four and $5,000. Uh, and so that's, that's a prospect that people have. And then once they receive disaster assistance, the only other options available are low interest loans through the Small Business Administration, but a low interest loan is something that has to be repaid mm -hmm. uh, over time. So, so in terms of the value proposition, flood insurance is, is much cheaper in the long run to maintain in case you do have that significant impact mm -hmm. event. Yeah, and in, in the case of disaster assistance, it's often not going to be enough to cover the losses, correct? Uh, correct, correct. There's, and there's a pretty low limit. And there's a big misperception out there about that. Um, I, in, in a lot of disaster work that I've done in the past, uh, unfortunately, I've seen time and again where, where those affected by the flood think that the disaster assistance is going to make them whole. And disaster assistance, at best, gets somebody back on their feet temporarily, um, but falls far short of making them whole, whereas flood insurance comes probably closest to, to restoring somebody and making them whole. Okay, let's talk a, a minute about uh, something called advanced uh, flood hazard information. Uh, it's really dealing with how people find out how the base flood elevations are going to change with regard to their insurance, where the new map lines are going to be in terms of the 100-year floodplain. Uh, you know, FEMA has to issue those at some point. Uh, tell us a little about how that's going to work for people in, in, in the Northeast. Sure. Um, you know, after some of the big previous events that we've had, after Hurricanes Katrina, after Hurricane Ike, um, and, and now uh, with Sandy, uh, FEMA produced a product called Advisory Base Flood Elevations. Um, and these advisory, basically this advisory flood information that, uh, that FEMA produced helped provide a guide for people um, that chose and, and wanted to rebuild and stay in that area, but wanted to do so in a more safe manner. Um, so FEMA is producing uh, what they're going to be calling uh, advisory flood hazard information. These data should be coming out very soon, actually. And that is the information that we would urge not only property owners, but business owners, as well as communities, to utilize, to adopt, and use that to rebuild. Uh, because if, if, a, if, if a community or if an individual doesn't use that data, what could what could happen is that the flood elevations eventually become become higher because they use those as the new regulatory elevation and then at that point the flood insurance rates are going to be based on that elevation and so if you re chose to rebuild and it's lower than the new elevation that's higher the flood insurance rates on that structure in the future could be significantly more expensive which is a source of great consternation for people and certainly was down in the Gulf Coast after Katrina. Exactly, exactly. So the advisory flood elevation information is, is critically important and is even more important now that Congress has amended the flood insurance program and basically said there's no more grandfathering of the old rates. So when you have new flood data, that's what we're going to be basing the rates from. Okay. Uh, well, speaking of those reforms, I mean, there were some recent reforms this, this past summer uh, of the uh, National Flood Insurance Program by Congress. Uh, can you tell us a little about that, the impact of, on rates from those uh, new reforms? And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and I think this is, this is also a factor that people need to consider when rebuilding. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Flood Insurance Reform Act of, of 2012 uh, essentially moved a lot of the flood insurance rating to more of an actuarial basis. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as most people know, the program had been in debt um, to the tune of about $17.5 billion previously, so there had to be a new way forward. And the flood insurance rates, um, the flood insurance rates that, uh, uh, that rate structure under the, uh, under the Reform Act moves a lot of those, eliminates a lot of those subsidies and moves those more to actuarially sound rating. So what does that mean for people? Well, again, if um, a structure is substantially damaged, um, then 
the rates are going to move to actuarial rating, and therefore, if it's rebuilt, it needs to be rebuilt in compliance with the flood elevations, especially the advisory flood elevations. Uh, if the structure is a repetitive loss property, if it's a, a business or a second home or vacation home, it will be moving slowly towards um, actuarially rating. Uh, but the point is, flood insurance rates for the next four or five years are going to be increasing significantly. And so people are naturally going to want to know, how in the heck can I reduce my flood insurance rate increase? Um, a few of the other changes, one of those I think that's going to be helpful is that there are hazard mitigation programs as part of the flood insurance reform. Uh, and those programs provide some assistance to do these mitigation activities. And mitigation activities are things like elevating your house in place, maybe relocating it out of a flood zone, flood proofing a non-residential building, um, and, uh, or, or possibly just tearing a building down and making the land open space. Uh, but those programs are, are getting an additional uh, amount of funding that I think will be important for this, uh, for, for those affected in this event, and, um, and will help offset the pain that the flood insurance rate increases are going to cause. And of course, it's important for people to understand well, why are they doing this. A large part of this is because the flood insurance program has been in the hole financially, and it's important to get the NFIP on a sound financial basis, and there's no other way to do it other than to pay the rates that reflect the, the risk. That, that's correct. I mean, ASFPM has been on record and, and will continue to work with FEMA and, and even the Congress on affordability uh, issues that go along with these rate increases because um, there could be there could be segments of the population, low-income folks, even meet um, um, uh, middle-income folks that could have a real tough time paying those rates. And so we need to be smart about how we address that, uh, whether it be through mitigation or some other means. Okay. Well, let's get to one final question that I'm sure is on the minds of almost anybody who owns property in these kinds of areas, and particularly in the Northeast right now, uh, looking forward, which is how can I reduce my flood insurance premiums? What are the ways that I can do something to change that scenario? Sure. Um, the easiest way to do that is, especially when rebuilding or with new development, is doing something called freeboard. Mm -hmm. And whether it's the community's regulatory flood elevation or the new advisory flood elevations that come out, there's nothing to stop a person from going even higher. And the higher you go above that base elevation, the lower your flood insurance rates are. And so if you go two feet or more above the base flood elevation, you're generally talking a 40 to 60% reduction in flood insurance premiums. And so that, the, the incorporation of freeboard above whatever regulatory flood elevation is key in, in, um, in keeping those rates low uh, for, for some time in the future. Um, and the cost of doing that to increase it by an increment, uh, if you're going to have to elevate anyways, is really not that much compared to the cost, the overall cost of the home. Um, and then one of the uh, one of the other things that at the community level can be done, that's called that's uh, participating in a program called the community rating system, and the CRS is a program where the community joins. It does activities beyond the minimum required and they get credit for those activities. And that credit is shows up as discounts in flood insurance premiums. Mm -hmm. So for, um, for the policies that are in effect in that community, you can have enough points to reduce the premiums in increments of 5%. You can go up to a 45% reduction in flood insurance premiums for the best class of CRS communities. So um, there's no fee to join the CRS, and communities really should consider that if they have any amount of flood insurance policies at all. Great. Well, thank you very much, Chad. Okay, thank you, Jim.